Romans chapter 1, the title of my sermon this morning is this, the gospel compels me. The gospel compels me. Romans chapter 1, and we're going to begin in verse number 14. Paul says, I am obligated both to Greeks and non-Greeks, both to the wise and the foolish. That is why I am so eager to preach the gospel also to you who are in Rome. For I am not ashamed of the gospel. Why? Because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew and then to the Gentile. I want you to notice the emotions the feelings that Paul has with regards to the gospel. The first thing Paul says in verse 14, the first emotion that you see is an obligation. I am obligated, both to Greeks and non-Greeks. When it comes to the gospel, Paul feels a obligation, a sense of responsibility to impart the gospel to people. Now you have to understand, this is Paul's obligation, but it is not just for Paul, it's for you as well. You see, when Jesus gave the Great Commission, he didn't say, all of you pastors go and preach the gospel. All of you missionaries go and preach the gospel. No, he says, if you are a disciple of Jesus Christ, your responsibility is to preach the gospel. You have an obligation to do this. And so Paul says, I feel this obligation on a regular basis. Every day I wake up and I have this yearning, I have this this passion, and I feel this obligation to do it. Imagine that you were walking around and had the cure for cancer in your pocket. Would you not, when encountering a person with cancer, feel an obligation to reach down in there and give it to them? You, You would... You would feel a sense of responsibility that would motivate you to give them the cure, right? That's what Paul says his position is towards the gospel. Because the reality is this, people are walking around with a disease far more fatal than any cancer. It's called sin. And friends, you walk around with the cure to that sin. It's called the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And so we need to feel that same sense of obligation to preach the gospel to people, to give them the cure. Now, Paul doesn't just stop at obligation. He says, that is why I am so eager to preach the gospel. Paul says, I feel obligated to do this, but not only am I obligated, I'm happy to do it. I'm eager to do it. I can't wait to do it. Why? Because if you've ever shared the gospel with somebody, then you know the feeling he's talking about. There is no greater satisfaction in the world than to help someone else find Jesus. And Paul recognizes that reality and says that eagerness, that desire, that passion motivates me to do what God's called me to do. If you met that person with cancer, you wouldn't just feel obligated to do, you'd be so excited to do, man, you got cancer? That's great! Wait, no, 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 that came out wrong. But it's great, and here's why, because I've got the cure. You see, that's the message of the gospel. The message of the gospel is what? The gospel means good news. Good news is this, that there's bad news first. The bad news is we're sinners. We're on our way to hell. That's not Josh's theology. That's the Bible's theology. We're on our way to a real horrible place called hell, and we put ourselves in that situation. That's bad news. But the good news is, Jesus came. He took our place. The punishment that was supposed to be on us has come upon Him. And if we put our faith in Jesus, we come in relationship with Him, and now we are made righteous in Christ. That is good news. And if you've got good news, you can't help but tell people about it. I'll tell you what. You know, I travel for a living. I'll sit down next to people, you know, complete strangers on the plane. And it doesn't take but a few sentences before I'm wanting to talk about my daughter. Uh All right? I've got this daughter of mine, Anna, all right? She's 18 months old. My wife and I, we had this independent scientific study done. She is actually the cutest baby in the world. (laughs) Now, my wife and I were the ones doing this study. I promise there's no bias. It's just all science. But... I love my daughter, and I love, I'll talk to strangers about my daughter all the time. Man, let me show you this picture of my little girl. Let me tell you what she's doing, what she's saying. You know, just this week, I taught her her first Bible verse. And so I said, I said, you know, I taught her two. 
First Corinthians or First Thessalonians five seventeen. Pray always. And then John eleven thirty five, Jesus wept. And so, you know, hey, look. Yeah, we'll start. We'll start. She's one and a half, right? So, so now when I say to her, Anna, can you tell me your Bible verse? She goes, Jesus wept. You know, and so I want to tell people about that, right? I'm telling you about it. You don't know my daughter, but I'm the one on microphone, so I'm going to tell you. And, and the reality is this. When I get around complete strangers, I'll start talking about her. Why? Because I love her. Because she's important to me. Because I'm excited about what's happening in her life. Friends, how much more should we be ready and willing and excited to tell people, complete strangers, about Jesus? He's more important than my little girl is. I'm more excited about what he saved me from. There's nobody who's done what Jesus has done. Yet we often keep it to ourselves. Look, I've come this morning to encourage you, but I'm also going to step on some toes this morning. Yeah, well, good. (laughs) And Paul says this is our position or should be our position to the gospel, an obligation and an eagerness. And then he says in verse 16, for I am not ashamed of the gospel. Now, if I started going around and asking each of you, are you ashamed of Jesus? Of course, most of us would probably say no. But... I'm more concerned with what your actions are telling me than what your words are. And so I believe that if we really understand the necessity to preach the gospel, to fulfill the Great Commission, we should tell people about Jesus. We shouldn't be ashamed of him. We shouldn't be embarrassed about that reality. And yet, while we may know that to be true, how many of us are actually sharing the gospel on a regular basis? Now, notice what Paul says. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Why? Because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. Here's what Paul's saying. I understand this reality that even though there may be a natural inclination for me to feel ashamed, for me to be embarrassed about sharing the gospel, I refuse to listen to that feeling because I know that it and it alone is the message that saves. If I don't share it, they will die. So I don't have time to be ashamed or embarrassed about the gospel because I know that somebody's eternity is at stake. Imagine with me, you're walking down the street and you look across the street and you see a building that is on fire. At the top of the building, there are people up there living their lives. They're unaware of what's going on. They're cooking, they're cleaning, they're just living. And at the base of the building, there's this awful fire that has broken out. Now, if you observe that, you would feel an aw- a responsibility to do something, right? You'd walk by and you'd say, hmm, this is a bad situation. <laughs> and there are people up there who are completely clueless of what's going on. So what am I going to do about it? I'm going to start shouting to them. I'm going to start jumping up and down. I'm going to start waving my arms. I'm going to start doing whatever I can to get their attention. Because if I don't tell them, they could die. But what if at the moment that you're about to start shouting and raising your arms and jumping up and down, you begin to think, oh, man, I don't want to be embarrassed. I mean, that's a little weird. You know, what if somebody's driving down the street and they just see me shouting to this building? I mean, that's going to be crazy. They might, that's a little embarrassing. Or, well, what if somebody's in the middle of taking an Insta story and then I'm on their Insta story like jumping up and down like a maniac (laughs) I mean, I don't want to be an internet sensation like that, right? So the potential embarrassment, I'm not going to... No, no, no. None of you would ever think of those things. You realize if there's a building that's on fire, you don't care about the potential of looking stupid or of the shame or embarrassment that could come because your singular focus is on their lives are at stake. If I do nothing, they could die. That's what Paul says his position is. I understand you might feel ashamed of this gospel. I understand you could feel feel embarrassed about sharing this gospel. But I don't have time to listen to those feelings because it and it alone is the message that brings salvation. And so friends, your family, your friends, your neighbors, your schoolmates, your employees, your co-workers, everybody that you interact with, Those people need Jesus. They're trapped in a building that's on fire. And if you don't do something about it, they could die. So we need to feel obligated. We need to be excited. 
And we can't let shame or embarrassment keep us from fulfilling the Great Commission. This is Paul's position, and it must become ours. It must become ours as well. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 19, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, there's no 1 Corinthians 19, all right? (laughs) In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 16, he says, when I preach the gospel, I don't take credit for it. He says, look at this, woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. In other words, I've got this responsibility. If I don't do it, there's going to be something come upon me. I'm going to be held accountable for that. Here's a principle within Scripture. When we do what God commands us to do, we are rewarded for it. Thank you, Jesus. When we disobey what God tells us to do, there are consequences for it. That's the way the kingdom of God works. That's the way our Heavenly Father works. I understand, you know, now that I've got a, a, a child of my own, I can see that. When my, when my daughter obeys, man, I, I praise her. Yes. And I get excited for her, and there's rewards for her. But when she disobeys, there are consequences. Amen. And that's the way it is with God. Yeah. Think about this for a moment. In Deuteronomy 28, <coughs> Moses is listing all of these good things that happen if you obey. And he says in the first 14 verses, all these verses we love to quote, I am the head and not the tail. I am above and not beneath. I'm blessed going in. I'm blessed going out. Everything I touch is blessed. And we just love it. All right? (laughs) And so that's what happens if you obey. Then Moses spends the next 54 verses describing all of the curses that shall come upon you if you disobey. That's the way the kingdom of God works. Okay? And I want to give you a great example of this from the Old Testament. If you have your Bibles, turn to Ezekiel chapter 33. Ezekiel chapter 33. Jeremiah Lamentations, Ezekiel. There's blessing that comes when we preach the gospel, and there are consequences that come when we don't. Ezekiel 33 Verses 1 through 9. The word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, speak to your people and say to them, When I bring the sword against the land and the people of the land choose one of their men and make him their watchman, and he sees the sword coming against the land and blows the trumpet to warn the people, then if anyone hears the trumpet but does not heed the warning and the sword comes and takes their life, their blood will be on their own head. Since they heard the sound of the trumpet but did not heed the warning, their blood will be on their own head. If they had heeded the warning, they would have saved themselves. But if the watchman sees the sword coming and does not blow the trumpet to warn the people and the sword comes and takes someone's life, that person's life will be taken because of their sin. But I will also hold the watchman accountable for their blood. Son of man, I have made you a watchman for the people of Israel. So hear the word I speak and give them warning from me. When I say to the wicked, you wicked person, you will surely die and you do not speak out to dissuade them from their ways. That wicked person will die for their sin and I will hold you accountable for their blood. But if you do warn the wicked person to turn from their ways and they do not do so, they will die for their sin, though you yourself will be saved. In the Old Testament times, you'd have these cities that were walled cities, and there was a job of a person within the city as a watchman to stand on the city and to warn the people of the city in the event that there was an attacking army coming so that the people could ready themselves for battle. And what God is telling Ezekiel, and I believe what he's telling you and I today, is that we have been called as watchmen. And he says to Ezekiel, you are a watchman for the people, not physically, but spiritually. And if you see impending danger coming and you do not warn the people, they will die. And he says it very clearly. They will die for their sins. I'm not saying that you're the person who sent that person to hell. Everybody goes to hell because of their own sin. That's what he says. They die for their sin. But I will also hold you responsible. Their blood will be on your hands. But if you warn them... And they refuse to obey. They die and they die for their own sins, but you will not be held responsible because you did your job. 
You, as a disciple of Jesus Christ, are a watchman and a watchwoman over your family, yes. over your community, yes. over your city. Yes. You have been given a God-ordained right, and it's a blessing. Yeah. God could have chosen anybody to preach the gospel, but he chose you, yes. and that's a blessing. But it also is a responsibility. And if you do not take that responsibility seriously, then you will miss an opportunity and you will suffer consequence for it. You are watchmen and watchwomen over your city called by God to do this job, to warn people of the impending danger that is coming on its way. And if you choose to sit idly by and let that danger come without proper warning, you will be held responsible. As Ezekiel, as God says to Ezekiel, their blood shall be on your hands. And I told you, I didn't come just to motivate you. Right. All right? Because this is the word of God. It's, it's, it's an encouragement and it's a conviction. Even as I preach it, I feel convicted. Yes. God, help us to take this responsibility seriously. There's a great gravity to this. You realize we're talking about eternity. So much of our lives are spent on things that don't last, that don't matter. There's only one thing you get to bring with you to heaven. People. Your house is not going with you. Your cars, your clothes, everything that we spend so much time focused on doesn't last. And this life, it's here today and gone tomorrow. James says it's like a vapor. I mean, it's just in light of eternity. So we need to invest in eternity. And that is exactly what Jesus did. You know, you talk about this series, Who is Jesus? Jesus was the Savior of the world. That was his whole purpose for coming. I'm come to seek and to save the lost, he says. And that's our responsibility as well. I want you to think, even right now, I believe God is bringing to your mind people that need Jesus. You're a watchman over them. You've got to tell them about him because they're trapped in a burning building, because they're dying with a uh, a sickness worse than cancer, because there is impending danger coming and you are responsible to tell them. Turn, if you would, to Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9. One of the most famous passages on the Great Commission, on the harvest. Matthew 9, verses 37 and 38. The Bible says, Then Jesus said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest field. The harvest is ripe, but the laborers are few. I want you to notice something about the language here. The harvest is is ripe. Now, I'm not a farmer. Let's be very clear about that. <laughs> All right, I'm a city boy. I didn't grow up on a farm or anything like that. But my dad's side of the family are wheat farmers. Mm-hmm. And I've spent time out on the farm and I've talked to them. And one of the things that you learn when you're around farming community is that it's very, seasons are very delicate. Yes. They're very specific. And what they, my uncles would tell me is this. They say, you know, Joshua, a lot of things can happen. The, 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 we, we need to make sure that, you know, we need to hope that there's not a too bad of a winter, but we have to have some winter. And it needs to get cold, but it can't get too cold. We have to have rain, but if we have too much rain, it can ruin our, I mean, all this stuff. And then the thing that they say is this. We don't know exactly when the harvest will be ready, but when it's ready, we better be ready. Right. Because if you wait too long, yeah, you'll miss the harvest. That's right. 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 Notice what Jesus says. The harvest is is plentiful, present tense. Yeah, present. Not the harvest was plentiful. Not the harvest will one day be plentiful. No, the harvest is plentiful now. Now, if it was true then, how much more is it true now? Okay? And so what this means is this. We can't sit around twiddling our thumbs thinking about the things that we should do to bring in the harvest. We got to start doing and going and bringing in the harvest. Okay? That's what my book's called. Go! That's the first words of the Great Commission because guess what? If you just sit on your Uh couch, (laughs) 
If you just sit on your couch all day long, you're not going to find sinners. You're not going to win people to Jesus. You know, I've found in my experience, sinners don't come knocking on my front door. And if they do, you usually don't want them. <laughs> or else they're Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, in which case I invite them in and let me talk to you about the gospel. But here's the reality. That's why Jesus said you got to go and preach the gospel. you got to go into the world. The harvest is plentiful now. That's why Paul says in 2 Corinthians 6, 2, Today is the day of salvation. Not tomorrow. Not next week. Not next month. You better go bring in the harvest today. Because if you miss it, if you wait too long, you'll miss your opportunity. I was preaching about the Great Commission in Egypt three years ago. And as I was preaching, you know, I don't speak Arabic. And so I've got this translator who's translating things into Arabic. And as, as I'm preaching, um, he's, he's listening and he's receiving as well. And he was convicted. He came back the next day and told me this story. He said, I had been waiting. I, I'd created relationships with three separate Muslim people in Egypt. In Egypt, 95% of the country is Muslim. It is illegal to share the gospel with a Muslim. If you do, you could get imprisoned or even killed. And so he had created a relationship with these three Muslim people with the intentions of one day sharing the gospel with them. And he was just waiting for the right time to share the gospel. Now, I'm sure we've all been in this situation ourselves. Yes, we're just trying to create a relationship and waiting for the right time. And, and as I was preaching stuff out of this passage, the harvest is plentiful now. Let's go get it now. Today is the day of salvation. Let's go get it now. Yeah. He felt convicted. And so he went that night to each of those three Muslims, he said, I can't wait any longer. I gotta share the gospel with them now. I don't, I'm not guaranteed tomorrow. They're not guaranteed tomorrow. Let's go share the gospel. And he came back with the smile as big as you've ever seen because he said, last night I led all three of those Muslim people to Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Now here's my question. Who is that person that you've been waiting for the perfect moment to share the gospel with them. Because I'm telling you, if you wait for the perfect moment, it'll never be the perfect moment. You'll be waiting until the day you die. If my wife and I waited until everything was perfect before we started having kids, we would have needed an Abraham and Sarah type of miracle. Okay? Because guess what? I did not wait until I bought all the diapers I'm ever going to need. And I had no idea how many diapers I was going to need. I didn't wait until I had all of her college education paid for before we started having kids. I, I didn't wait until I had purchased all the toys and all the clothes, everything that I was going to need. If I had said, let's just wait until we got all these things in order before we start having kids, we'd never have kids. Yeah. If you wait until the perfect time to start doing something, you'll never do anything. But you need to understand, when it comes to someone's salvation, now's the perfect time. You got to start sharing with people now. My prayer is that you would get so encouraged right now that you would be thinking about those people and you today would give them a phone call. You today would invite them to lunch and say, hey, I got to talk to you about something. When we're talking about salvation, it's the most important topic in someone's life. And so today is the day of salvation. Remember what Jesus says in John 4, 35? He's talking to the disciples and he says, you say four months more and then the harvest. But I say, Lift up your eyes and look at the fields. They're already ripe for harvest. Don't put off for tomorrow what must be done today. This is the gospel we're talking about. People's lives are at stake. You aren't guaranteed and I'm not guaranteed tomorrow. And so we need to do today. That's why Jesus says, work while it is still light for darkness is coming when no one can work. This is the importance of the Great Commission. In Luke chapter 14, Jesus tells a parable of the wedding banquet. And there's a master who's got servants. God is representative of the master, we as the servants. And he says to the servants, I want you to go out and start inviting people to the banquet. And so the servants go out and they're inviting people to come and people start giving all these bad excuses, okay? <laughs> well, you know, I just bought a field and I need to go look at it. I mean, if you bought the field, you already know what it looks like, right? <laughs> but... No, we're not coming. I just bought a pair of oxen and I need to go work them out. I've never heard that excuse, by the way. <laughs> but, you know, hey, I just got a new car and I, I want to go drive it. And, and so they start giving these excuses. And so some people come, but a lot of them don't. And so the servants come back to the master and they say, uh, there's still room at the table. And so he says, well, then go out and find people you didn't ask before and invite them to come. Yeah. 
Well, okay. So they start inviting people and, and um, more people come, but there's still room at the table. And so they go to the master, master, there's still room. What are we supposed to do? Well, he says, I want you to go into the highways and the byways, yeah. the places nobody wants to go. And listen what he says. He says, compel them to come. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Compel them to come. Yeah. Now, I want you to be, hear me clear. I am not advocating Christian kidnapping. <laughs> okay? It's a quick way to get in trouble. But here's the principle of what Jesus is saying. You got to do whatever you got to do to get people into church. Do whatever you got to do to get them here. You know, if it means, hey, I'd like to buy you lunch next Sunday. Is their salvation worth a $10 lunch? Okay. Listen, I know a lot of people, they may not come to church, but they won't pass down a free meal. Okay. You know, you do whatever you got to do to get them into lunch. You remember the story I told earlier of the burning building. If you run up to that burning building, and it's on fire, and the people in the top, they don't know what's going on. You get up there, and what are you going to do? Hello, sir, ma'am, nice to meet you. My name's Joshua. I know it's a little strange. I've just come in here, but just wanted to introduce myself, maybe suggest it'd be a good idea for us to quickly move down the stairs. That's not how that conversation goes. You run up there, you grab them by the hand, you pull them out, and you run as fast as you can out of that building, and we'll make introductions later. Because you know that their life is at stake. We don't have time for all these pleasantries. We got people to save. And that's what Jesus is saying. Let's compel people to come. Let's do whatever we got to do to get them to church. Let's do whatever we got to do to get them into the family of God. Because eternity is at stake. Eternity is at stake. This is not... I mean, there's many good things in life that we can invest in. And that we can do. But salvation is the most important. I praise God for all of the things that have been happening recently with the way the church has responded to these hurricanes. I saw something on the news that 80% of the relief that's come in has been from churches, Christian organizations. Isn't that awesome? And even you guys going down, bringing a $5,000 check in Jesus' name for for the hurricane relief. And I praise God for that. And that's being the hands and feet of Jesus. We got to do that. But let me tell you something. That money won't last for forever. The houses that they build won't last for forever. The roads they have to clear, those things won't last for forever. They're good. I'm not saying you don't do them. But that's not the most important thing. The most important thing is seeing people get saved. And that's why when you look at Jesus' life, I want you to think about what Jesus did. When Jesus came, he didn't have a house. He said, foxes have holes and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Because he knew his time here was short. I got 33 years. I'm not worried about a house. He didn't have a donkey. When he needed a donkey to go into Jerusalem, he had to get the disciples to go get him a donkey. Because he wasn't focused on transportation. Now listen, I'm not saying it's wrong to have a house or a car. I've got both, Mm -hmm. all right? And I believe that God wants you to be blessed and to live in abundance, but that's not what we're here for. Jesus spent his whole life, you know, he didn't even build a church. He didn't didn't build a church building. He didn't build an orphanage. He didn't start a Bible college. Those Those things aren't bad, but those things aren't the main thing. Those things are supposed to get people to the main thing, right. which is salvation. Yeah. Yeah. That's what matters. It matters about people's hearts. There you, go. you see, if you build an orphanage and take care of kids, but you don't give them Jesus, right. they may still grow up and die and go to hell. Right. If I pray for a sick person and they get healed and they can walk and they couldn't walk before, that's great. But what if they don't accept Jesus? They still die and go to hell. Right. Right. You see, yeah. Jesus is caring most about your souls. And the souls of those around you. That's why he spent his whole life seeking and saving lost people. And we are called to do the very same. How do we do this? With the power of the Holy Spirit. And I believe this is a church that you know that. One of the great transformations in scripture is that of Peter. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, Peter fled from the scene. And when he was approached, it says, by a servant girl, just to ask if he knew Jesus. 
he denied her. History tells us that girl was probably about 10 years old. Peter's a grown man, okay? We know this because he, uh, he has a mother-in-law. How do you get one of those? Okay, you gotta be married. So here's a married man. Uh, it, says that in, it says that when he found the, the temple tax in the fish's mouth for him and Jesus, the temple tax only had to be paid for men that were 20 years and older. So we know this is a married man. He's at least 20 years old. I mean, this is a grown man. And a 10-year-old girl comes up and simply asks him, do you know Jesus? Yeah. And he denies even knowing him. Yeah. This man is scared, ashamed, embarrassed. But I want you to see what happens in Peter. Because Jesus died on Passover. Pentecost is 50 days later. All right? These are Jewish festivals. And so after Jesus, he dies Three days later, he rises from the den, dead. It says that he then spends 40 days with his disciples, teaching them, just reaffirming all of these things. And the last, some of the last things Jesus said before he ascended was, he said, now go wait in Jerusalem for the gift my father promised, that you will then receive power. And so then they go, and they, Jesus goes up. So you had three days, then you had 40 days, so now we've got seven more days that they're in Jerusalem, waiting until Pentecost comes, which is in your Bibles in Acts chapter 2. The Spirit comes upon them in power. And Peter gets up and he begins to preach. Now think about that. This man, 50 days earlier, had denied even knowing Jesus to a little girl. Now that same man is getting up in front of thousands of radical Jews. The Bible says that these Jews traveled from all parts of the world. Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, all these places. These guys are serious Jews that they travel all this way just to celebrate this feast. And then Peter gets up in front of them and says, you killed the king of glory. You are responsible for his death. You are in sin. He's no longer ashamed. And he preaches with such passion and fire that 3,000 of those radical Jews get saved in that moment. That is the power of the Holy Spirit. You see, some people think that when you get baptized in the Holy Spirit, the only reason you have that is so you can speak in other tongues. Listen, that's an aspect. That's a portion of what God wants to give, but that's not the main thing. Jesus said in Acts 1.8, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And then what does he say? He doesn't say so that you can speak in tongues, so that you can prophesy, so that you can have visions or dreams. No, no. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. That's the primary reason that God gave us the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Boldness to preach the gospel. He knew that the disciples on their own could not accomplish what God wanted them to do. You realize there were 12 people. They knew Jesus. And now they're supposed to tell the whole world about him. That's a big task, especially when most of them don't want to hear it. But the boldness that comes from the power of the Holy Spirit drove them to the uttermost bounds of the earth. And you and I are here today because of their response to that mission. And Peter shows us the transformation that takes place. So you might be here and you say, Joshua, I know it's important to tell people about Jesus, but I'm scared. I'm ashamed. I'm embarrassed. I don't know what to say. You got all these excuses. And we've been there. And Peter was there. And I'm telling you, that's why God gave you the power of the Holy Spirit. To give you supernatural courage, boldness, to preach this gospel. A passion to do that which you cannot do on your own, but with His help. And that's why Jesus didn't even want them to do it on their own. He said, don't do anything until you receive this gift. See, so some of you have been straining and trying to do it in your own abilities. And God's saying, no, 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 no. Let me come in and help. That's what the gift is for. God is not interested in your excuses. He's interested in your obedience. You, You don't have an excuse good enough to not tell someone about Jesus. Jesus, when he gave the Great Commission, did not say, go into all the world and preach the gospel unless you don't want to. (laughs) Unless you're not a good speaker. Unless you didn't go to Bible school. Uh Unless you've only served Jesus for a year. Unless, unless, no, no, no. There were no qualifications put on it. It was go and preach the gospel. 
Okay, so then why aren't we doing it? Amen. Let's do it. Yes. Let's do it. Yes. You, you know, your country, your state, your community needs Jesus. Absolutely. And they're not going to find Jesus on their own. They need you to tell them. That's why Jesus didn't say, hey, don't worry about preaching the gospel. People will figure it out on their own. No, no, no. <laughs> Left to their own, they get themselves in trouble. That's, right. that's what sin is, okay? And that's why Jesus says, you did not choose me. I chose you. And now God has chosen you to go help somebody else find him. I want to end today with Luke chapter 15. In this chapter, Jesus shares three parables. The lost sheep, the lost coin, the lost son. All of these are representative of God and his position towards other people, specifically lost people. And he says here, when there's a woman who has, a, who has 10 coins, she gets back home and she realizes I've lost one of them. Now, <laughs> she turns her whole house upside down looking for that lost coin. She's not content with nine coins. She's looking for the lost one. Yes. A man has 100 sheep. He gets back and brings them all into the pen and realizes 99 are here, but one is missing. He's not content with the 99 that are here. He is interested in the one that is lost. And it says he will leave the 99 to go look for one. And then, of course, the story of the prodigal son. That you've got two sons. And while, while the man is happy, the father is happy, he's got one at home, he is constantly thinking about the one that's lost. His mind is consumed with the one that is lost. He can't help but think about that which is lost. Jesus, I want you to understand this, Jesus is so happy that you're saved. He's so happy you're here today. You are his favorite. Yeah. I am too. But I want you to know something about the character of God. As much as he's thrilled that you're here, come on, come on. he is far from content. Come on, come on. Amen. As happy as he is that you're here, he is far from satisfied. 